Oh, yeah. Lord God the Father, just ask you to help us with your word, Lord God. It's Tracy for life, Lord, and for Ron, wherever he is. Yes, Lord, we agree, Lord. And Lord God, just lift up this time that we have the word and we have the Lord Jesus. A better and gracious hope, Lord God. Help us with mercy and grace. For Jesus' sake we pray. Jesus Amen. Amen. Up to the page. John chapter 1, verse 13. Which were born not of the blood, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So again, we we'll concentrate on this verse for a while now. It's the flesh became of God. God is 100, I mean Jesus is 100% God, and he's 100% man. And not of the flesh is, there's no person wanted God to come and do what God did. Man, like I said last time, I don't want to go back into it, but man was shot for his God for the sins that he does. Um, so what we have here is we have Jesus Christ is truly of God, being God. By the will of God, by the love of God, by the long-suffering of God. We have the story of Jesus Christ. We don't have the story, and I'm going to say religious realm. I'm not going to say Bible. Mm -hmm. But the realm of Christmas is not just to get presents and have a big fat man come down your chimney mm -hmm. and then come up with Easter Bunny and all that. We don't have that for that reason. We have the story of Jesus Christ. Because he's God manifest in the flesh and he came to seek that which is lost. And one of the things is that, you know, what's religion different from Jesus is Jesus is alive. Religion, when it dies, stays in the ground. And people will cuss the name of Jesus, but not any other person of religion. Why don't they cuss in the name of the Pope or Allah or anything else? Because Jesus is God. Amen. So, what well, we have, 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul writing. What we're going to look at today is God in the flesh. You, and I'm going to say this respectfully, but if you wanted to when Jesus was here on this earth, you could have walked up and pinched God. They were elbowing him in the face and the ribs and the sides when he was among them. Peter said one time, Jesus turned around to the disciples and said, Who touched me? Peter's like, We're getting, man, we're just getting fists and elbows and getting kicked and. People are in our face. What do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching us. And this is where the realm of religion ends because we have a God. And let me check it. Yeah, we're going to look at it, I believe, in Job. Yeah, we will. Lord willing. Mm -hmm. So I won't jump, it, jump ahead. But 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy. And yet this is a controversial subject we're going to talk about today. Did God come in the flesh? And there are some people who don't believe, and we've already talked about, and we go back with the studies and find it, but we already talked about the virgin birth. The virgin birth is controversial. It can't happen. Well, with God, anything can happen. God manifested in the flesh. Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that. He's a man. The Jews believe he's a teacher. The, the Muslims believe he's a teacher. A man, maybe a prophet. Maybe not give him that much credit. Mm -hmm. But God, that's controversial. I mean, think about it. If you were to go to a mass at a Catholic church, you're going to eat the literal body, literal, literal, they'll tell you, literal body and drink the literal blood of Jesus. You mean you're going to eat God? Mm. And a Catholic will say, no, 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 no. Then you don't believe Jesus is God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then you're going to eat God. Well, no. You see, Jesus is not God, and Jesus is not the fleshy part of God. So, great, without controversy, great is the mystery. Now, here's a mystery. There are seven of them in the Bible. 
of godliness. Now here's the mystery. God was manifested in the flesh. Explain God in the flesh. I can't. And yet I can. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preach unto the Gentiles, believe on in the world, received up the glory. Believe the, I believed on Jesus Christ. Salvation is you Amen. must believe that Jesus is God. Amen. You can't have somebody come up to you and have Jehovah Witnesses again. I'm going to I'm going to tell you what they what they told me. Oh, I'm safe. Do you believe Jesus who is manifested God? No, we don't. Mm. That's manifest in the flesh. You can't be saved. Okay. And when you just say this prayer, to, you know, so you, you can put another notch on, on a Christian's belt, if they don't believe that God is Jesus and Jesus is God, there's no salvation. That Paul wrote to Timothy, a minister, a preacher, hey, this is one of the doctrines you've got to teach. That's the virgin birth. That's the sinlessness. And I dealt with the Jehovah Witness. And I, I got him over and over to know that him, his people, and whatever they call it, it's not a church, but whatever their denomination they think they are, do you believe that Jesus was sinless? Question him over and over and got down to a reliable fact is, yes, Jesus is sinless, he said. Then Jesus has to be God. Now, when we look at Jesus Christ in the mystery of Jesus being in the flesh, He never sinned. He never looked upon a woman to lust after in His heart. He never had an idle word. When we, in our idle words, according to the book of Matthew, we're going to be judged for the nonsense that we speak. Saved or lost. Imagine all the movie scripts are going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. Every single line, every single act, thank God time has ended. But Jesus Christ, in the flesh, okay? I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm born again, but I am a sinner. I sin. Jesus Christ, God, manifest in the flesh, lived 33 and a half years without sin. And yet, think about it. Now, now this is where you blow the realm of this mystery then. Mary had to change Jesus' diaper. The Bible says in Hebrews that he had to learn obedience. Jesus, you got to go to bed now. And when we get into, we build up to the book of Job about this. we got to realize we have a God now knows what it is to be a human. No other God has ever been a human in the realm of all religions. Now when you've studied the, the Romans and the Greek gods and mythology, that which I have, to a detail. None of them became a human. They had mated with humans and produced a half god, half human, or whatever kind of thing. But never any of the gods actually became a human. Now, you got Tammuz. His, his holiday is Christmas. He was born, you know, to, like, you know, to be a son of God, but he wasn't never God. Alexander believed the same thing, that he was the son of God, and yet not God. Mm -hmm. So let's look at Luke one twenty six. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And we're getting again into the story of the birth of Jesus. God being born. Now don't and it's hard, here's this mystery again, don't say Mary's the mother of God. She's not. She's the mother of the flesh of Jesus. Though he is God, she's not the queen of heaven. There's that fine line again of like the, the Trinity. Where they exalt, and Mary, I mean listen, she, she's a great woman because God said you're, of all the women, you're the one. But you're not the queen. You're not blessed above all women. J.L. was. You're just blessed among women. Never give her the title of God. Because that was in her, well, in her womb was God, but it was also the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. So there's a half of Jesus, and yet there's a whole of Jesus. He said one time, he said, when they said, you know, tell us the time, no one knows the times but my Father in heaven, nor the angels. 
And there's a realm of Jesus being the flesh and there's a realm of God being in glory that there was a difference between the two. How fine was that line? I don't know. Can you kill God? And yet He died on the cross. Can you tempt God? Though He was tempted by Satan. Luke 1, 26. And the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Joseph will adopt Jesus and from that adoption this is where he gets the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and, and said, Hail, thou art highly flavored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, not above women. J.L. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast her mind in men of salutation that shall be. Why am I favored? What are you talking about? God knows me. Look how humble she is. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Alright? Women do that. It's a natural thing of women. And bring forth a son, okay, and shall call his name Jesus, all capital. Now every time when, when somebody is pronounced to a, a father to be or a mother to be, you know, you're going to call his name Isaac, you're going to call his name Ishmael, it's not all capital. Now, you capitalize the first letter, that's proper. Proper noun. Here, it's Jesus all capital. And when you run the majority of all the capital words in the Bible, it's a reference to God except mystery, Babylon, and harvest. I forget the whole thing. He, Jesus, shall be great. Shall be called the Son, capital S, of the highest God. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's where he's a king of Israel. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom shall be no end forever, eternal. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall, how shall this be, saying, I know not a man? I have not had no relations with any man at all. Mm -hmm. There are people that teach that Mary had relations with other men. Well, I don't know how they could not read the Bible unless they change it. And the angel answered, he said, no, you've been with a man. No, that's not what he did. He said unto her, the Holy Ghost, that's the third member of the Trinity, shall come upon thee. Now, that's where some people put the relations. That's not how it happens. That's a Roman and Greek God. They're coming unto women. That's how the sons of men in Genesis 8 or 9 came unto the women. Sexual relations. This is not sexual. This is the mighty power of God, the miracle God. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest, that's God, shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also, that holy thing, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Now, there it is. There's the impregnant of Mary by the Holy Ghost power of God, of Jesus to be the Son of God, called Jesus. Mary knew no man. So the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, has no sin as the seed of Adam who sinned. We are born of a man called Adam. And from Adam to all the generations to, to, the, to that baby who was just born right now are born in sin because of Adam. And that baby was just born now and all the babies are born are of Adam. Jesus Christ was not of Adam, born of a woman who has no seed. Genesis 3.15, by God, was born sinless. And from the womb, being God, being sinless, of no Adam. And we just read in 1 Timothy uh, 3.16, that's a mystery. No doctor can explain it. How, and this said, it shall overshadow thee. What? Well, what's the overshadowing? I don't know. I mean, was it, boom, there's, the, there's baby Jesus, the holy thing? I can't tell you. I can only tell you, overshadowed her. What's that mean? I don't know. And I'm not afraid to say I don't know when I don't know. It's a mystery. 
It's not a mystery why God came in the flesh. He came to save us sinners. And we'll see that in Job later. Chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Uh oh. And this taxing was first made by Cyrus, the governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone in his own city. And Joseph, that's Mary's husband, also went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because, of his, because he was of the house and lineage of David. The only way God could get Joseph to be where Jesus needed to be to be born was that to tax the world. Don't fight taxes. You might be fighting God doing so. The Bible says you're supposed to pay taxes. But we're not going to get into that. There it is. God used taxation to get Joseph where he's supposed to be. Because Joseph is not where he's supposed to be. So he uses a Roman tax. And interesting. To be taxed with Mary, his spouse wife, being great with child. So her spouse, and she has a child, and it's not adultery. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. Why would they have to say firstborn if she had no other children? She did have other children. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them at the end. The place is packed. Why, why is there no room at the end? Because everybody's there being taxed. The place is crowded. And there were in the same country shepherds, of all people to call. Jesus says, I'm the shepherd and sheep. Abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And they were afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings. That's gospel. Gospel means good tidings. Mm -hmm. And great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day the city of David, the Savior, capital S, which is Christ, which means anointed, of the Lord God. I mean, Lord, it's God. There was, there was a child just born. He's the Savior. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. And this shall be a sign unto you. Jews require a sign, so those shepherds were Jewish people. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swallowing clothes lying in the manger. Why do we have the manger? Why do we have that baby wrapped up? Because the angel said to those shepherds, that's your son. There was never to be a nativity scene. Shepherds, when you go into Bethlehem, the one that you're looking for is lying in the manger, and he's lying wrapped up in clothes. Make sure you don't get anybody else or anybody anything else. That's the one you're to go find. Kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. That's not taught in Sunday schools. And suddenly there appeared with them the angel, with the angel of multitudes, the heavenly host, praising God and saying, not singing. That's important. Don't trust your hymnal. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward man. That's second advent. It came to pass that the angels were going away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And there came with haste. <laughs> They're running. Mm -hmm. They're running. <laughs> and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known the broad saying, Which was told them concerning the child. Now look at it. They come running to find that baby that the angels spoke of. That this is God. This is the Savior. You know what the next thing they do when they found Jesus? They went and told other people. Now you come to Jesus. Maybe people call me strict and people may call me other kind of... But if you come to Jesus and find Jesus, you're going to go tell others. If you don't, I'm going to question your salvation. If you don't tell others about Jesus... And they don't even have salvation. It's not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. He's a baby. Mm -hmm. And when they left, they're telling all the Jews in Bethlehem, guess what happened to us? So there is God manifested in the flesh, angels showing up, angels proclaiming, prophecy. He told Mary, you're going to have a son. Well, you can have either or. It's a 50-50 chance. 
So, there it is. There is God born. There is Jesus Christ born. The Savior. God manifested in the flesh. No other woman can, can claim this, though there have been women to claim. Uh, like I said, um, Alexander claims that his mother had him, you know, supernaturally without without a father. And there, through, again, Greek and Roman mythology and Babylonians and all that, there's these, been these children. Tammuz is one of them. Tammuz, which you celebrate on Christmas, is an antichrist that was born of a virgin. But it's not the Christ. It's not the Lord. Not the Son of God. He's son of small G-O-D-S. So 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5. Paul going back to instruct a young man in the ministry. Timothy is a disciple under Paul and he's active as a minister, as a preacher. So we're looking at God in the flesh. He's in the flesh, but he can't sin. The devil tried to test him. With the three tools that the devil uses, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eye. This is Satan's three tools. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God, all right, and one mediator between God, and that's not Mary. Mm -hmm. Though the church says there is. The man. There's one mediator between God and men. Excuse me. There's one between God and men. The man. I guess the Catholic Church doesn't know how to spell or they got their sexes all messed up like the world does today. Because that says M-A-N. Go to Mary. Say prayers to Mary. Uh, she's not a man. The man. Go to your priest. Okay, it says Christ Jesus. The anointed Jesus. That's what Christ means. It means anointed. You don't go to a priest. You go to Jesus Christ, the man. That's God. There's only one person you can go to to get the relief of your sins by you repenting and getting forgiveness of your sins by you truly repenting and getting right with God is Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. If we shall confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's Christ in, in God. So there it is. Our meteor is the man Christ Jesus. There's only one God. There He is, Jesus and God. They're one. That one that mediates between God and me is Jesus, and He is God, and He was man. So He stands on the realm of, I am holy and righteous. Father, you would not believe what it is to be a human. I've done it for 33 and a half years. You're not going to God doesn't know that. God never cried unto John 11.35 at a funeral. How many funerals did he see? He saw Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rebecca, the twelve tribes of Israel. He saw them all die. He saw Job die. He never cried. Lazarus is in the tomb. He waited. He shows up the tomb. Everybody's crying. And Jesus cried because everybody was crying. He said, man, note to self, God, this is hard. Oh man, I've seen Abraham die. I've seen Isaac. But I watched the tears. I watched Abraham get upset. He had to bury Sarah. But this is the first time God is at a funeral. All my friends are upset. My friend is... And Jesus knew he was going to raise him out of the grave. And yet he wept. And the Bible says he knows all our afflictions. He knows all our afflictions. Because he lived them. He got tired and slept on a boat. Have you ever, ever got so tired you sleep and somebody woke you up and you didn't want to be woken up? Jesus is asleep on a boat, passed out, and the storm comes up and they come wake Jesus out of his sleep. Because they're scared. 
You ever got thirsty? You want to drink? You ever got to get it? Twice the Bible records Jesus asking for water, and he never got it. One time he got vinegar. I mean, come on. Does someone hate you so much that if you need water, they're going to come and give you vinegar? I would think that somewhere around today, I mean, maybe not most people today, but if you stopped up to somebody and you're dying of thirst, I think you asked for water, I think somebody would try to give you something, but not Jesus. How about this? You got friends? They stay close to you? One friend went to Jesus with the cross, John. One sold him out. You got bad friends? So did Jesus. You got trouble amongst your friends? Man, Jesus is stopping those disciples fighting all the time. You know the biggest problem you have with a disciple? Who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. Look at me. Look how great I am. And if John records, there is so much in the gospel that's not recorded, I can just imagine. And yet Jesus had the patience. He, had, he was sinless. He did not. He got angry, the Bible says, but he said no. I mean, I don't know if Jesus ever stubbed his toe, but if he did... So have you. Listen, you can't say any affirmity is too much that Jesus never suffered. Isaiah 53, the final 24 hours of his life, he took every sin. Some people will say, well, Jesus never lived with a wife and stuff like that. He had 12, 12 men and four of them were fishermen, and I grew up with fishermen. They are impossible. He had women traveling him all around all the time. He had a guy come up to him. The father just died. He said, Jesus, tell my brother. I mean, he had the problems we have. So when you go to Jesus and you cast your burden upon him, he's been through it. He may not have been married, but he's gone through what we've gone through. And when he went through his pain and suffering upon that cross, he did it without drugs. He did it with the whole world against him, except for his mother and John. And even in his dying breath, get ready to say, it is finished. He, he, he scopes out of his breath. He says, John, behold that mother. And he says his mother, behold, I forget what he says about John. And then he's dying that cross. He, the body, they say in crucifixion, you are suffocating. You are, your body fluids are building up. And he turns to that repentant thief and says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He, the, the repentant thief was mocking him a few moments ago. That's God in the flesh. And, the, and if you don't believe that, John, like you said, we looked at John 11.35. Mm -hmm. Jesus wept. Uh, John 19.28, maybe. I got a note here. It's kind of hanging. That may not be it. I don't know why it's hanging. Hopefully it's John. That been one of those verses I read afterwards. Said, hey, this will fit. Because John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. John nineteen eighteen, when they crucified him, and two others with him, on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst. So. Crucifixion is a harsh punishment. It's agony. And after he's been beaten, the Bible describes his back as being plowed. He went, Jesus Christ went through the hardest of hardest brutality that no man could ever survive. Yet he survived. How do you know Jesus is God? By what they did to him and he survived and he gave up the ghost. Come on, anybody who's had a toothache? It's a little tooth. It ain't that bad. Oh, yes, it is. Pancreatitis. Oh, it ain't that bad. Oh, yes, it is. I can tell you when my medicine's going to wear off. Now, think about how much Jesus Christ loved us and suffered. He had to be God because he would have been dead before the cross if he was a mere human, as the Jehovah Witnesses say. And by the way, they didn't die on that cross either. The two thieves are alive. Jesus gave up the ghost. 
and even Pilate marveled. Philippians 2.7 I mean, when we get these little kitty per, uh, uh, not parade, these kitty programs and these little kitty things of you know the passion, you're not going to ever, ever Hollywood can ever match what happened to Jesus. You can't. Philippians two seven. But made himself of no reputation. Jesus did not get the press. I mean the press, I mean the newspaper, the media, he didn't get his picture in the newspaper. He didn't do things for people to recognize him. He didn't do what people did today. Oh, look what I did and called the newspaper and I'm coming to a story about you. But doesn't he have a reputation amongst those that are saved? That's the fruits of what he's done for us. And took on him the form of a servant. What's a servant? Man. And was made in the likeness of men. What's that? He had eyes, nose, ears, mouth, hands, fingers, a belly. He had to go potty. It's kind of hard to think about God going potty, don't you? Mm -hmm. But how about God sleeping? You know, people always say, you know, if God ever fell asleep in the back of the ship, that's why you know the, the storm came. Well, I don't know because God slept other times. And there are times the Bible records in the Gospels that he would go out in the middle of the night in the mountain and pray all night without sleeping. You know, from the time, and it doesn't even record, but when he went up to that upper room with the disciples to have that last supper, and to the time that he gave up the ghost and died on that cross, the Bible does not record that he slept. He went to the garden afterwards and prayed. He didn't sleep. Peter, James, and John slept. Judas came and brought, the, brought the, the, the soldiers and brought them to the, the Sanhedrin. He didn't sleep. The Sanhedrin had a kangaroo courtroom in the middle of the night. They shouldn't have. He didn't sleep. They brought him to Pilate early in the morning. The Bible doesn't record he slept. That whole morning, that whole afternoon, Jesus is, is being tossed around by Pilate trying to get rid of him. He didn't sleep. That afternoon, after being bitten, I mean, be, be, being beaten, and the crown of thorns being punched by the soldiers by having his beard pulled, having his back ripped open. He's carrying his cross to Calvary. He didn't sleep. On the cross, he's, he's talking. He, he's alive. He's speaking to the repentant thief. He's speaking to his mother. He's speaking to John. He didn't sleep. You got insomnia? So did Jesus. But God in heaven never needed sleep. You imagine, you imagine the time when Jesus went back in, in Acts chapter 1 and the Father and him had a little talk. Son, what was it like? You're not going to believe this. God, you've never felt tired. I'm telling you, tired is... You know what the most thing I've seen with many Christians is they don't sleep. Sleeping is a problem amongst people. They got a disease called insomnia and they say if you don't sleep, you could die. You get medical problems just as much as having high blood pressure. And yet our God slept on the back of a boat. And it just, he saw Jacob pull up a couple rocks to fall asleep. And as I said, God already cried. He wept over Lazarus and he wept over Jerusalem. It's interesting. Galatians 4.4 4. We haven't got the realm of what God has done for us through Jesus. I mean, churches today, and Tracy knows, they got, they're got they fooling around today. It's a nightclub. It's a comic club. It's a social club. And they're missing so much of teaching the people. Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God's not going to do anything early. All right, so you want a prayer answer. You say, God, answer it now. God's not going to answer it now just because you want him to answer it now. 
If I said, and I'm not saying, I, I make an illustration here, but if I were to say that the rapture is going to happen on June 6th, tomorrow at 3 p.m., God's not going to do it just because I said. God has the date of the rapture, and he, that date is already set. Why was Jesus born when he was born? Whatever date that was. We don't know what date it was. I'll tell you why. But when the fullness of time was come, that's when Jesus was born. Well, how come he wasn't born when the fullness of time? How come God won't? Fullness of time. That's our God. Why is there no rapture of church? I'll tell you two reasons. Number one, the fullness of time. And number two, God's long suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. You know, there's a possibility we're not raptured because somebody out there is not listening to God for salvation. But for the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, capital S, made of a woman, not man, made under the law. Christ came in the law. Christ did the law. He did everything He was prescribed by the law to do. Of a woman. And we've already read that in Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2. Christ was born. Job says, as a man born in, as a man is born of a woman is full of days and full of trouble, something like that. So was Jesus. His whole his own hometown tried to have him killed. His own priests tried to have him killed. His own disciples wouldn't listen to him. Hebrews not Hebrews 4.15. Hebrews 4.15 Now, are you going to go and join a religion that says that Jesus is not God when we're reading what we've been reading so far? When somebody says, well, how do you know Jesus is God? How do you know you're really the truth? The testimony of Jesus Christ Himself, no man could do what He done. Come on. Stand up right now in this gazebo and say, God, I like you for the breeze, but turn that natural AC on so it will be all nice and cool and not sweaty. Ready? Go ahead. It didn't work. Did not Jesus heal the multitude? Did he not take care of lepers? No, no women. Did he not have a lame man cast his hand out? All right. Be healed. That didn't work. I tried that. And I would say I tried enough faith to try that with... With my wife, <laughs> be healed. It didn't work. So Jesus had to be God. And he told them impossibility. A guy comes to him, he's got his hand all withered up. He says, stretch off thy hand. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I can't. Stretch it out. Stretch it out. Hebrews 4, 15. God does the impossibility that only God would get the credit. You know why I'm not going to hell by Jesus Christ and He gets the credit? What am I going to do? That I would be so happy with God, God would be so happy for me not to go to hell. What? Really? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We got infirmities? We all got them. But was made in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. You got problems? So did Jesus. I told Tracy today, I said, Tracy, I, I, I can't understand what you're feeling. I don't know. She understands. But I know someone who does. You say, well, I mean, did, did God go on dialysis and all that? But I guarantee his kidneys were messed up, quite messed up. He knows. He knows the feelings. He knows what your husband doesn't know. He knows what your wife don't know. Because he's God as Tracy keeps saying. He's the one that made the kidney. We are fearfully and wonderfully made I think he understands now through Jesus. That's what's so great about having God being Jesus and Jesus being God. He understands. Now he may not answer in your time. God is so patient I am so not impatient. He's so long-suffering. And we may be suffering for somebody else, and I can't stand that about God. I'm sorry. But in the fullness of time, God has His ways, but go to God. 
Then go to your husband. Then go to the pastor. Then go to the doctor. Go to God first. And don't get mad at your spouse. Don't get mad at your children. Don't get mad at your doctor because they don't understand. Primary is they don't, cannot understand. And then you know what? They got their own infirmity that you don't understand. And yet God does. And it's remarkable since Tracy and I from day one that we met and we said we're going to get married is we've been on our knees and we can't get on our knees now. We've been God forever in prayer. She told me that things she can't remember. She remembers things me praying. I didn't know she knew. That's all I got. I can't give her a quick screen. I was looking the other day of things for kidney, you know, uh, you go, oh, wives tell about kidney stuff. And I thought, wait a minute, you know what? It may not work. It may make it work. God, sorry, go to you. God, I got troubles. I got to go to you. He knows our infirmity. And you know how much He knows? You know how much He's going to help you? He says, I'll give you a brand new body. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. Amen. You're never going to say goodbye. You're never going to die. I'll, you know what the Bible says in Revelation 22, 21 or 28? You know, you know what the Bible says? God shall wipe away our tears. We're going to cry at Revelation 20 when we see our loved ones get go us off into hell. And what the Bible says is, Timmy, I don't know, you've got a Kleenex. But I'm not saying for joking. I'm saying, I don't know what he did. But he said, he's going to wipe away your tears. What a loving, compassionate God that God says, listen, I know what you're going through. I've lived it 33 and a half years. Got angry? So did I. You sinned? I didn't sin. But oh, when I died on that cross, I took all sins. So the way He did take our sins. 1 John 4, 2, I hope. Boy, I write message. Like a chicken stepped on a ink pad and went for a walk. <laughs> First John 4 2. And then we'll get to the great verses. First John 4 2. I guarantee this has probably changed at least a New World Translation. I would not have Jesus if he's not God. I would not. I grew up with a Jesus, not God. I grew up in the Catholic Church with Jesus was nailed to that cross there. And every time we did the Easter thing, He rose from the grave. I look up and say, well, wait a minute. He arose from the altar and went back to the cross. That's where the little boy would look at that thing and say, I don't understand that. Thank God God put that doubt in my heart. Thank you, Lord. 1 John 4, 2. Hereby know ye, do you know ye? The Spirit of God. That's the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what I wanted. What did I say? 4 2. Okay, yeah. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Jesus Christ has come of the flesh is what? God. Now you take your King James Bible and you show that to a to a Jehovah Witness, and if he does not say he's God, you call him an Antichrist. Get off my doorstep. John writes to us and says, That is God, and if you don't say He's God, you better get off my property. How's that work? That's a command. Do you believe in God the Father? Amen. There he is. Do you believe God the Holy Spirit? There he is. Do you believe in Jesus? There's all three of them right there in that bird. And they're all one. Now, Job chapter 10. You ever question God? You ever say God? I have. I'll be bold to say it. I don't know if you're holding it or now, but Job chapter 10. You ever ask God, what are you doing? It's good, you know what? Because what if God's going to reveal to you what you're going through? Hey, you know, you got to go see this doctor, or hey, you got a problem in your life, or hey, I'm doing it for this purpose. I'm trying to get your attention. Job chapter 10, verse 4. Job 
has been battered by Satan. Job 1 and 2. Mark Job 1 and 2 in your mind. Know that. He had everything stolen. He had everything burned with fire. He had a military encampment against his property. His seven sons were killed in a place like this right here. We're at by a, by a tornado, whirlwind. And then the devil gets him from head to toe with boils. I've had one boil twice. I would not want boils. He's scraping himself with a broken piece of pottery. They're itchy and they're sore. And they're gooey. I had to shoot across the room one time. A faucet. And then he turned around. His wife comes up. Did they take that integrity? Curse God and die. Curse God and die. Then his three friends show up. Made it worse. So when we get to Job chapter 10 verse 4. Job is complaining to God. Has thou eyes of flesh? No. Or seest thou as a man seeth? No. Are thy days as the days of man? No. Are thy years as a man's years? No. Job says, Who are you, God? Have you ever been like I have been? And the answer is no. No, it's not. God can say no. This one don't have. Oh, it does have a date. Approximately fifteen hundred and twenty years later, approximately. Job, I've got eyes. I've got hands. They're all wrapped up in their swaddling clothes, but here I am. Thirty-three and a half years after that, Job, yeah, I've got eyes. They've been all bloody. They got tears. My hands have now nail prints, Job. I have been beaten, Job. I've got a lot more pain than you got, Job. And I tell you what, Job, when I finish this afternoon and I give up this ghost, I have an appointment with you with the repentant thief and you in paradise. Just wait for me. Job was in paradise. I guarantee it. I guarantee Job would be in the man's, in the man's book of life. I guarantee it. And Job had it bad. There are two worst pains that people say are on this planet today. Third degree burn, when you spend your whole life in the hospital and there's no relief. And then they say giving birth, pregnancy. And yet there's one pain that God suffered for us in the flesh. The Bible says that He is so still marked in glory today with those nail prints with those probably marked with his back still from the cat of nine he may still have those marks in his forehead from those thorns and yet if we suffer and I hate to say a little because I, I, I know what suffering is and if we do what he tells us to go out and, and preach the gospel to the lost people and grow Christians properly there's coming a day when those that receive Christ all the pain will be, you won't even remember it. No. Old things are passed away. You're not going to have archaeologists dig in glory find pill bottles. There'll be no archaeology looking up beer. And uh, one of the things that gets me by in life is I, there's somebody worse than I am today. And there's coming a day that there, there are women and men out there today who don't have physical pain, but they get emotional pain by their, their partner. God will separate that in one day when He you know, takes the party home and sends the other one to the judgment that they'll get. Let us save the lost. That guy, that woman is going to get it one day. This world, this earth is a veil of tears. Job said, okay, God, how, how do you feel like I feel? God said, okay, just wait, Job. You know, Job never saw Jesus, and yet God answered his prayer. That's an awful long time. Mm -hmm. That prayer request that Job's 
claims to God. I think I think Job rightfully would say that. I don't know how long it takes the body to rot in the grave, but I guarantee Job's body has been rotting. And God says, okay, time to fulfill Job chapter 10. In the fullness of time. And it may not be our time. But God has the power. And when you, the biggest thing we got for each other is prayer. That's it. We got people all over the world praying for us today. God is great. 